you agree? Okay. So, here we are. Start the recording, gentlemen. I'll go through the reading on the policy. Uh, Linux meetings involve participation by industry competitors. And it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to missing agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples <coughs> of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in the Linux Foundation antitrust policies. If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company counsel, or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrea of the Grove of the firm of Gaspier of the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. So welcome everybody. And welcome to Joel again after his meeting on the 23rd of June. This time they will show us EBL meets EPU, what he calls digital made in heaven, digital marriage made in heaven. So Joel, I'll leave the word to you and for one more speech on this straight fun sake. Can you hear me, Joel? Joel, you muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes I can. can. Okay. There's a bit of echo. Okay. Everyone see my screen, I assume. Yeah, we can see it. It's good. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Yeah, so you call it a marriage, uh, Andrea. It's it's a match, actually. It's a, it's a, a match made in digital heaven. But first of all, thank you, uh, Hyperledger and Andrea, to, to invite me for, well, probably my last Hyperledger uh, presentation for this year. I'm, I'm quite certain of it. Um, it, the trigger for this presentation was actually an article I wrote, and uh, indeed it brings two key documents in trade together, an electronic bill of lading and an EPU, and I will explain more about uh, the EPU. So the agenda for today, uh, first we'll, we'll set the scene a bit, what's the background, because e EBL meets EPU, it's a bit cryptic, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit of background. Um, also what is China Systems really doing in this area? Uh, then I'll like go into the business case itself, because that's, of course, the key part of the presentation. I'll also uh, give some insight on, into the legal challenges that, uh, that exist, like with everything that you try to do in digital trade today. The criteria that we've applied when we were defining the solution and then the last part, of course, is well, probably the most interesting part is a, a high level description of the solution, because we are, of course, still developing this. Uh, we've written an article about this. We've done the design and the development has started. So let me start by setting the scene uh, first, uh, because people will probably ask, what is China Systems really doing before diving into the topic of this digital uh, collection, uh, let me first position China Systems, of course. China Systems, uh, for those people who do not know us, we are one of the leading uh, trade and supply chain finance solution providers. Uh, so we provide back office solutions to banks, also front end uh, solutions, electronic banking solutions to the customers of the banks, the SMEs and the corporates. Uh, so that's how China Systems is traditionally known in the market. Uh, but for, I think, just for more than a year now, uh, China Systems has established a, a core team of 
experts on, uh, I would call it digital trade, uh, because we have, of course, a huge history in uh, for 32 years now working in trade. We've probably integrated to about every single system that exists in, in, in the context of trade. Uh, and we've set up a, a TDS team. It's a trade digitalization services unit, which is composed of business and uh, technology experts on, on optimizing trade. Uh, uh, the objective of this unit is to look at all uh, efforts that we can actually have in, in, in the collaborative trade space. So whoever is in trade, we all provide part, a piece of the puzzle. And it's very important to understand who is left and right of you not just companies, but also data-wise. What happens before you start getting involved with this trade transaction and what happens after it? Because ultimately, if you want to optimize trade, it's very important to understand the ecosystem you're part of, get to get out of your silo, uh, so to say. Uh, this unit does not only uh, provide services on China system solutions, of course, we love to do that, uh, to provide our services related to only China systems, back office and front end solutions, but that's not the case. Uh, we also provide uh, consultancy and strategic advisory services to FIs, financial institutions, corporates, consulting firms, strategy advisors, and technology companies. So also when no China system software is involved. And that's important. Uh, I think to really have an open mind about what you do in trade, you cannot just focus on your offering alone. So we set up this unit, uh, we've got our own blog, we're writing quite a number of articles, and one of the key drivers of this unit is to, of course, support a interoperability by design. It's, it sounds like a bit of a marketing statement, but it is something which is really very important to us. Uh, just just to give you an idea, because if it's still too vague for some people, we will typically integrate, China Systems will integrate its solutions with accounting systems, with all financial messaging uh, uh, platforms, whether that is SWIFT uh, on FIN or MX ISO 2002, or whether it's uh, EDI factoring for FCI for factoring business, or any other uh, financial messaging, that's what we do. Obviously also integrate with FX, treasury solutions, risk management, everything to do with credit line management, bank country risk, uh, all sorts of risk, compliance, the obvious one, um, management information systems, customer relationship management system, digital document technology, AI, ML, you see them all listed here, and the list goes on and on and on. And uh, probably the ones at the bottom are the ones that we are probably now strategically looking at most, uh, especially IoT, it's still, so for some parts in trade, it's still early days, but we, we already get uh, requests because we also provide asset-based lending and uh, inventory finance uh, services. So if you want to start doing asset-based lending and inventory finance, uh, inventory is stored in warehouses. IoT devices can be used, smart, she smart she shelves, smart bins, uh, smart containers, all of those things um, become relevant the moment you start taking risks on, on financing inventory or financing stock or assets. So we have a very open mindset in terms of integrating with anything which can, gives val which, which can give value to our, our, our proposal. Yeah, the, the obvious one, and it's, it sounds like it's a cliche, of course, but it's quite important before I show you the next slide, which is a bit of a scary one, perhaps, but uh, we look at digitalization as, as really understanding uh, all the existing dots that exist within the global trade ecosystem, and then efficiently collecting them with a customer-centric mindset, because trade has existed for not hundreds, but thousands of years, the core of trade and the risks involved in trade have not really changed. So if people say we have a new solution for this or that, well, usually it's something which already exists, repackaged potentially on a different technology platform, or maybe by, by connecting different dots. Uh, there are not that many new uh, initiatives really, really totally new. This is a reference to the article. I'm not going into the article right now, but this is useful background. It's an article on our blog 
about, well, we call it a digital BNB. That was sort of a bit of, I have to admit, a bit of clickbait. But it was the B, of course, of bill of exchange and the B, the other B of bill of lading. So a customer centric mindset and connecting the dots. Now, I won't explain this entire slide and, and, and people can look at it afterwards on the YouTube. They can get a copy of the presentation. But when we look at trade with a customer centric mindset, this is what we are looking at uh, mainly. Uh, you got importers and exporters, buyers and suppliers, and their business is not, it's not LCs, it's not collections, it's not supply chain finance, though those are all means to an end. They are producing stuff, they have to manage materials, they have to manage inventory, they, 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 they need a warehouse, they, 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 they use all sorts of services, whether it's logistical, insurance or financial services, all in the context of a trade transaction. And that's why we look at, you know, how does this data flow inside an organization? Uh, and that's why you see you have typically the P2P, the purchase to pay processes, and on the other side, the uh, order to cash processes. That are actually, from a financial point of view, the key flows. And Trade agreements uh, lead to purchase orders. Purchase order leads to invoices. Invoices leads to trade finance instruments, LCs, collections, open account. But it's the same data actually flowing through the ecosystem, not just inside the corporate, but even if you go externally, all post-shipment services, whether it's trade finance, post-shipment trade finance, or whether it's logistical service, uh, an SLI, shipping instruction, whether it's to, 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 to ask for an airway bill or a bill of lading or an ECMR, for which there is a new protocol now, they share a lot of their data with an invoice. So an invoice is actually, I call it the purchase order and the invoice are quite important in terms of trade. Bill of lading is a very important document, but it follows actually out of uh, an invoice. A lot of the data comes from the invoice. But anyway, that's sort of, these are sort of all the dots. The dots that we will be looking at in this presentation are just a few because this is about a digital collection. So we will be looking at a collection flow linked into a, what happens with a bill of lading and a, an e-bill of lading actually. And then of course the settlement, because if you, if you collect an invoice and if you finance an invoice, and you ship the goods around, uh, for, you ship the goods uh, on, mentioned on that invoice. Of course, you have to pay and you need to reconcile that. So we're mainly looking at those dots here. Now, the business case that we've looked at is a product which is actually quite popular, but is a little bit in decline. Uh, it's a documentary collection. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. This is not a lesson about what a documentary collection is, but from a risk perspective, a documentary collection can be situated by an open account transaction uh, where you just you ship your goods and you hope that you get paid. And on the other side, a letter of credit, which is more, more secure from a supplier point of view because it requires the buyer to establish credit with his bank. So there's more payment security. The collection is a little bit in the middle. It's a paper-based. It's a paper-based procedure, and that's why I think it's it's a very simple product. It's a product with high potential, but the paper is the one thing which actually is its major disadvantage because banks are being used as mailboxes to collect documents. An exporter gives an instruction to his bank, which is called a remitting bank to collect a set of documents. And as usually it includes an invoice, a transport document, often a certificate of origin, could be a packing list and a bill of exchange. Typically, uh, if it's uh, the documents can be delivered against acceptance. Because a lot of trade transactions include, uh, are not uh, based on payment at the site, but payment uh, typically 30 days, 60 days, 90 days after shipment or after invoice date which leads to a requirement very often for the supplier to get finance. And that's sort of the business case we looked at and said, how can we make this efficient, this instrument more efficient? 
products that I won't go in detail, but these are the key things that we're looking at. The exporter is the one actually who wants to keep control of his goods. And the importer, he would like to rem remain in control of his financial means as long as possible until, until he's secure that there is this quid pro quo takes place. I give you money, you give me goods. Now, what does a collection look like today? I could have put more paper, but it's paper, paper, paper. Uh, first of all, the exporter gives an instruction to his bank, typically via a form like this, a documentary collection instruction. And uh, he gives an instruction to his bank to collect uh, a set of documents, a bill of exchange, an invoice, certificate of origin, bill of lading, typically. Now, of course, we can automate this uh, collection instruction. Now we have our customer enterprise portal solution provides templates uh, for this that you can automatically generate the, those instructions. Uh, so there's a minimal intervention to, to pass that instruction to the bank. We also support direct collections where even the documents do not have to go, not have to flow via the bank, but some good customers of the bank, they're given a direct collection facility, which means that the bank is implementing a way to generate the letter, even with the bank's uh, stationery on the front end system. What the bank will do, of course, is they will do a check on all the instructions. They will do a compliance check on all the data before the letter is allowed to be generated by the exporter uh, supplier. So this is what a paper collection looks like today. Two main types, paper against payment and against acceptance. Now, what are the weaknesses of the process? Because that's of course has been the driver for us to develop this, we call it an e-collection uh, product. Uh, the first weakness is that uh, in case the buyer is unable to meet his payment obligation, there's not that much he can do because he sends the documents and then, you know, whatever, it depends on where he is. If he's on the other part of the world, it could take two days, three days, five days, seven days, depending on times, in COVID times even longer, uh, for the documents to arrive with his bank before they arrive at his counters. And, uh, and then you just hope as a supplier that he wants to pay those documents. So, there's not much, that much you can do to put pressure on, on the buyer. The second one, which I've already hinted at, the delays on the transmission of this paper. Typical problem, let's say, if you typically think China and Japan, and you have, uh, let's say, a uh, Chinese export, a Japanese import, or whatever, and uh, the goods are shipped, it sometimes happens that the ship actually arrives before the documents arrive. And that can, of course, lead to additional charges. You can have uh, the, let's say the terminal is not, the, the container is not allowed to leave the terminal without presenting the bill of lading, could lead to demerits charges. And you may have to go to your bank uh, as the import to ask them to issue a shipping guarantee to release goods. So it can get complicated. That has been the main reason why an electronic bill of lading has been such a popular instrument and especially lately more popular. But we know there's still challenges. So a collection often includes those two very important documents, a bill of lading, which is a document of title, which actually allows the owner, if it's a negotiable bill of lading, you have ownership, you can take ownership of the bills. You have to physically present this bill of lading. The bill of exchange is another uh, uh, transferable, a negotiable document. And it's very important in the financial world because it, of course, an acceptance of a bill of exchange means that the drawee is making a commitment to pay at maturity. And especially if you've got a bill of exchange, which is accepted by a bank, which is called an avow, it becomes an even more powerful instrument. So depending on the quality of the drawee buyer who's accepted it, this is a very powerful instrument, not just in the primary market of trade, because it's an instrument you can sell so the forfeiting market is the sec is is typically a second is a secondary market for bills of exchange because you can sell those instruments. So you're dealing with very a financial instrument and a logistical instrument which are actually 
giving a financial commitment and the other one is a, a commitment on the goods. So they are a perfect set of documents to bring into a quid pro quo process, but paper is too slow. So we said, it's pretty obvious, yeah? Why can't we bring those two documents together? So how can we optimize this and how can we resolve the weaknesses? I'll immediately say, before I start describing the solution, implementing the technology to solve this is, is actually the, the easiest part. And I, I hope my technical team would agree with that. But uh, the, the, the biggest challenges that we still have today is that, you know, you have to be able to legally move from physical uh, to legal documents. The context has to be, uh, I would I say, fully supported from an operational or a procedural from an audit point of view. So what about those uh, documents, especially with the bill of exchange, with an EBL, we already know uh, SDOCS, Bolero, WAVE, uh, the Corda EBL, there's, there's a number of initiatives already in this space, and the approach is to come up with a rule book, typically to create a framework uh, to which the participants to this electronic instrument, uh, the flows to which they participate, to actually make them operate in a closed legal environment by having them sign a rule book. However, I think, and that's one of the initiatives of, of ICC DSI, they're looking at the EBL, how can we actually move this, resolve this problem probably at a higher level to look at, uh, just like IATA did with the airway bill, and they are now reaching 60 or 70%, I think, of airway bills globally. How can the shipping industry take a consolidate those initiatives and actually resolve the challenges at, at a higher level? still giving uh, the floor actually to the people who provide functionality in EBLs, but, 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 but create interoperability at a higher level than the individual rulebook. So this is something we, what, what we expect to happen. How long it will take, you have to wait and see. But we are currently involved actually, it's, you see the word and on the left there, uh, it's not an or, it's an and story. Yeah? The, the first thing is uh, with the bill of exchange typically is that the bill of exchange for people who, from, I don't know who knows the UK or anyone actually who uses UK law because common law, UK common law is, is, is applicable I think in about 40% of uh, the countries globally and the rest is civil law and other formats but uh, UK common law uh, stipulates that a, a bill of exchange uh, cannot be an intangible asset. And that's one of the challenges. You cannot possess an intangible uh, or digital asset. So that is one of the challenges. So the law has to change. So we are part of ITFA. ITFA is uh, discussing this uh, with the UK government, with uh, uh, the ICC in the UK as an intermediary to start pushing for law changes. And there is a project currently going on uh, in the UK, and we're also signed up to this, is it's called the Digital Assets uh, Project, uh, which goes beyond bills of exchange. With bills of exchange, the promissory notes are two key targets for this project. The second one is, uh, so number one, we have to wait for that. This is, uh, we have to see what happens. The second one is, of course, you can provide a contractual solution. And that's one thing that also ITFA has done. Uh, together with Sullivan, they've defined an electronic equivalent uh, of the bill of exchange, which is compliant with English law. And this is the EPU instrument. EPU stands for Electronic Payment Undertaking. So it is the digital alternative for a promissory note and a bill of exchange according to English law. What this means is that we're creating a digital instrument, a file with the contractual wording inside the instrument. So that's a, a setting and a warning. Can everyone still hear me? Because I get a stability problem with my internet. Everyone can still hear me? We, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay. 
The third one, and that's last but not least, yeah, uh, everyone must have seen those abbreviations at least 10 times the last week, I think. UN Citral MLETR. MLETR. We, we have high hopes on this. Uh, it's, it's challenging, but it makes sense uh, because this is a supranational approach. Because, of course, those documents that we're talking about, those digital negotiable instruments, are not just they, they, the law can be different from country to country. So it makes sense to look at this from an international point of view. So United Nations Commission on International Trade Law is involved in this, and they've defined the model law and electronic transferable records. The good news is what IFA is doing with their, their called DDoC specifications, digital document specifications, they are fully aligning. So discussions ongoing at Luca Castellani uh, from UN Citral between ITFA, also with the ICC, and also with Oswald Curler from ICC BSI. So, so the DDoC specifications to whom we comply with the solution that we are developing and one that we already developed is, is compliant with, with this law. The key criteria, yeah, this is just, I'm, I'm quickly going over this, I'm keeping an eye on time. Uh, the key criteria that we've applied, this is not China systems as a software vendor operating on its own and, and hoping we will get somewhere. No, uh, it was a very calculated move. Uh, we're doing this as part of ITFA. We have to be part of a bigger organization who actually for its entire community, which consists of many banks and more and more fintechs as well, and is actually liaising with the ICC is liaising with the United Nations, is liaising with the UK government, with, with the different ICC entities in the different countries. So this is the way that we're going, going for adoption uh, by, 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 with a community approach. So it first started this initiative, the DNI initiative, which is called the Digital Negotiable Instruments, uh, uh, quite a while back. And recently they came to a, a framework, uh, a set of specifications to which it for believes uh, technology should comply with. So it's fully, it's meant to be vendor agnostic. Yeah, It's focusing on interoperability. It's developed with an open banking mindset. Uh, so we immediately, I think we, I have to say probably together with our partner in Egeo, we were immediately very active in this space because I was immediately, uh, we were immediately convinced about the potential of, 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 of the nature of those specifications because they leave actually, they stay out of the business aspect. So it is not, the objective is to, to reuse as much as possible infrastructure that exists today, but use new technology in areas where, where current technology may have challenges. So I'll explain it a bit more in detail, but we've used distributed ledger technology as a digital notary in the trade document space, but without getting involved in the business data itself. It's mainly a technical security-based uh, solution. So this is a quote from Andre Kasserman, who's the chair of ITFA FinTech Com Committee. We've implemented a first case already, digital guarantees. And we're talking uh, to at least, well, we're in advanced stages in one country, uh, talking to local chambers of commerce uh, on, on, on a digital guarantee product in a specific market. Uh, important, of course, is alignment with UN Citral and ETR. Now, what other criteria did we define? We're almost at the end of, uh, and before I start explaining in detail what the business case is about, what the flows are, we defined some criteria uh, for this. This is not a solution, in fact, that only China systems can implement. Uh, we are reusing our entire operating model that we have today for back office and front end. Uh, we are reusing it. Uh, we support paper collections. We support paper LCs. We can, we can support digital electronic LCs tomorrow if we have to integrate, uh, instead of SWIFT, integrate with with, with the V-trades, with the contours. For us, that's not really relevant. There's a lot of infrastructure out there 
And banks are not just going to change that overnight. So we are going to reuse it completely. For the customer, for the end user, it's fully transparent. Whether he goes paper, digital or hybrid, it should not really matter to him. It's driven by, by the relationships in the trade transaction. Same business practices that, that, that exist today, just more efficiently. Same documents, but of course use e-versions where applicable. And in terms of the ICC rules, which are very important in terms of, tra in terms of trade processing, in the collections, normally the uniform rules for collections apply. But in this case, we, we can use the supplement. There is already an EURC supplement for electronic collection business. So this is going to be uh, uh, an important case on EURC. The solution objectives are, are the obvious one. Same instrument, a collection, but fully digital. No paper. We're just removing the paper from the process. Faster, obviously. And the key element in all of this is the control, the financial control, and the control over the goods becomes a real-time control. And that's what you lose, of course, if the ownership or the financial commitment is based on a piece of paper, which can even get lost. That's, that's wrong. So we're now going to give, through digital interaction, real-time control over those bills of lading and bills of exchange. More cost-effective, more secure, obvious ones. Now... On the next slide, now this is, don't worry, uh, don't worry, I, 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 it looks complicated, but it is not. Uh, <laughs> this is the case, this is one of the three cases that was submitted uh, via ITFA and via through the ICC in the UK as an intermediate to the UK government. So the UK government is uh, really pushing uh, initiatives in the UK to support to support its exporters uh, in, in in financing trade streams uh, with limited with as limited as possible dependency on paper. So the UK government is pushing this, and that is why ITFA presented three cases, three business cases, and this was the first one. Actually, uh, it's 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 the, the business case is the finance of an exporter based on a bill of exchange being accepted by an importer or the importer's bank, but in a fully digital flow. The EBL it was actually not part of it originally of the case. That's why you see I've added it here number six because that's where we've introduced the quid pro quo. I'll briefly explain what happens because I do not know how many people know trade here. But the, the, the situation is this, an exporter has shipped goods to an importer. Now he wants to collect the funds for those goods, but he wants to retain control as much as possible while getting a financial commitment. And he doesn't want to work with an LC because an LC is too complicated. The importer does not want an LC because then he needs a credit line, et cetera, et cetera. So what is, what is the business case here? The setup is that the bank is, first of all, because usually those are term bills, let's say 30, 60, 90 days uh, acceptance or invoice date or even 120 days, whatever, depending on, on, on the parties involved. And the bank grants his exporter a bill of exchange, a finance facility or a discount facility. Instead of just collecting invoices, the exporter is going to uh, also create an export collection instruction, but with a finance request. So he's immediately going to ask his bank, do you want to finance me for this invoice and this bill of lading? Because of course the shipment by, by, by sea, uh, the documents involved are typically an invoice, a bill of lading and a bill of exchange. So he's gonna request finance. The bank is going to check uh, the, the exporter's uh, facility, whether he has a, a, a finance facility. And that could be tied into specific counterparts because the quality of the importer or the importer's bank, if they accept the draft, is, of course, relevant to take the risk. If they accept, if they say, yes, we're going to give, we're going to finance you, what will happen here, and that's where we'll use digital document technology of our partner, Nigio, and this is where we're using blockchain, 
we will be creating, the bank will be creating a digital bill of exchange uh, using Trace Original is the software provided by our partner Inigio. So Inigio is the, the Trace Original is the other software which is compliant with the DDoC specification of ITFA. So they're creating a digital bill of exchange and they're going to present this bill of exchange for signing because a bill of exchange needs to be legally signed by the drawer, the exporter, and they will also ask the exporter to endorse the bill of lading to the bank. What does that mean? That the bank will become the assignee of the funds. It means I'm going to only finance you if I become the beneficiary of this bill of exchange if it gets paid. So there is sort of a transfer of ownership and the rights to the funds actually from the export to the bank. This digitally sign it, we're integrating this with digital signature software because we're doing this in Europe at this point, we, we're working with Signicat. So we're using digital signatures uh, to actually support digital signing here. So the endorsement takes place. At that point in time, a digital collection will be presented to the importer. So this digital instrument will be presented to the importer for acceptance. And he can then, in it on, and then this is where the quid pro quo takes place because we're going to send, of course, additional information that will become clear on the next slide. We will present the entire collection with references to the documents, not the paper documents, but references to the digital documents to the importer. And this is where the quid pro quo takes place. The product is entirely based, and we go back to the first slide, EBL against EPU. What is happening here is the collection is based on the importer has to accept, if he accepts the bill of exchange, the bank will transfer ownership of the goods. They will change the holder of the bill of lading typically from themselves because usually the banks, if they take the goods as collateral, there could be a pledge. This is typically EBL functionality. They could take, they could take a pledge on the goods and they're then empowered to actually change the holder or change, re remove the pledge and actually make the import of the beneficiary or the owner of the bill of lading. So the exchange, the quid pro quo is you accept bill of exchange, I give you control of the goods, but in a fully digital, real-time interaction-based flow. So when that happens, an instruction is given, and that's where currently there's many EBL, well, there's about six, seven EBL providers, but we've started discussions at this point with Bolero on this. We had a chat with Yako and Raymond uh, on this last week. Uh, we're going to have an API-based uh, release of goods by connecting directly to Bolero's e, uh, EBL title registry platform. So this will be done fully digitally. The rest of the flow, of course, is after that, then the moment that this happens, of course, the bank can uh, uh, provide the finance, yeah. Uh, they could do it pre-acceptance, but usually banks will not take the risk. The moment that the bill of exchange gets accepted by the importer in his bank, at that point in time, the remitting bank is said, I'm going to give you money, 80%, 90%, 95 or even 100%, depending on the quality of the, the drawee. They're going to provide finance. The rest of the flow is actually the presentation for collection and the payment. We'll integrate this also with the payment flow so that we can reconcile this uh, at the end. But the key thing here is we use distributed ledger technology here as a digital notary because we have to make sure there is no duplication of bills of lading, no duplication of bills of exchange. The duplication of the bill of lading, that's controlled by the EBL provider. The duplication of the bill of exchange and the transfer of ownership, all the functions on the bill of exchange are managed uh, by us interacting, giving instructions to, uh, to the digital notary, the DLT digital notary provided by, by an EBL uh, Trace Original. So this is the digital uh, collection flow. Now, the last one is probably where it all comes together. And now, uh, yeah, this is where you have to open your mind here because this is the vision that we have on how we see 
and, and probably beyond the collection itself. You remember the slide where I showed all the paper on this slide, the collection order, the invoice, et cetera. The way that we see trade move, and I've always been a very strong believer that electronic invoicing and trade must come together. There's a lot of things happening in the e-invoicing space. I don't know if people, are, who knows Peppel, most people do not know Peppel, but if I, if I say Bathware or I speak about Tungsten, I, each country, there's now about 30, there's uh, more than 30 countries in Europe, uh, recently Singapore, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US, they've all signed up to the e-invoicing Peppel framework and do not underestimate the importance of this because all post-shipment trade, where it's traditional trade finance, every trade transaction includes an invoice. So what I'm trying to make clear with this picture is an e-collection is actually, is first of all, of course, it's a structure, it's an instruction. Instead of the instruction on a piece of paper, we are defining a, a digital instruction, which is EURC compliant. It's compliant with SWIFT MT400 series because the MT400 series by SWIFT are used to settle uh, collections, to create acceptance, under, uh, to, to give uh, advice as acknowledgements, uh, uh, ex advice of acceptance, et cetera, et cetera. The tracers, that's all, that's, that's, that's SWIFT based. And of course, compliant with a standard remittance letter, which we have today. The rest are the documents. Now the documents, instead of, yeah, we can actually include, if we want, we could include copies of a document inside a digital instrument. And we may have to do that in some cases still. But the reality is what we really believe in is that we will be pointing to doc stores or other uh, access points, yeah? That's why for the EBL, for example, instead of us starting to develop anything, we just have an API. We'll, the EBL piece of paper attached with a clip or whatever, or attached to a piece of paper is chained by a reference to an EBL, and we're just through an API connection the, the information of the EBL can be retrieved or, or transfer of ownership can be handled. This is where we'll fully integrate our workflows with, with those of an EBL provider. And these are typically the known ones. Uh, for the EPU, which is the Digital Bill of Exchange, that's where we're integrating and there could be more, yeah? Do not misunderstand, we're not exclusive on any of those topics here, whether it's bills of exchange or electronic invoice or EBLs, we're not exclusive. We believe in an open infrastructure here. We're depending on the parties involved, we can actually refer to, to, to whatever access point or whatever uh, blockchain or non-blockchain solution that the, which is used as a processor or repository of those documents. But at this point, we're integrating with Trace Original to manage the, the, the integrity, the uniqueness, the ownership, and the transfer of ownership of the bill of exchange of the digital version. So we're using this, this solution. For e-invoices, we are at this point uh, looking, could be there could be more value added networks, but Peppel is emerging right now. I know India is also looking at it. But Singapore, there's a lot of digital economy agreements being signed right now. And Peppel, Peppel, most people don't know Peppel, but look it up, look at the Peppel access points, and you will suddenly see, minus in Belgium, it's Codabox. Codabox, there's many in Belgium, but there's many Peppel access points across the globe. So instead of attaching invoices, we're just referring using a reference. So we believe in, in instruments, financial instruments, being fully interoperable with whatever digital document infrastructure that exists on the outside. So, and if you have this open approach, API-based, then you can actually, like you book, uh, I would say, like I do it for e-invoicing today, my accountant, uh, my invoices, I don't see any paper anymore. It's all connected. My connection to the payments, to the settlements, 
of my invoice, it's it's a button on, on my digital invoice. I click the button, pay now, pay later. This is also where trade needs to go. That's why it needs to integrate with electronic invoicing to bring trade origination, the entire range of financing instruments and the settlement have to come together. So this is sort of the idea behind uh, this, this vision uh, uh, that I have with this electronic collection, but with an open infrastructure mindset linking to EBL. And so I've not included certificates of origin, also a document which is, which is already an e-version. Uh, so we're creating a fully digital equivalent of an existing paper-based collection today. And we can also use, if banks say, okay, we want to process it over SWIFT, if you want, you can. Yeah, You can use File Act uh, to actually transmit digital instructions or digital documents over the SWIFT network. That was it. Uh, I'm ready for any questions that you may or may not have. Thanks, Joel, first of all, it was very inspiring and very interesting. Thank you, uh, Andrea. I see there's more participants meanwhile, and so I'm happy to see that, and some, some, some names are recognized. We, 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 <clears throat> we have a good attendance today, actually, yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if, if people have questions, yeah, I think the, the presentation can be shared, the YouTube video can be shared. You will see our contact details. Like I said, we are we want to work with well, everyone sounds like a bit of a cliche, but I'll I'll, I'll the last thing a problem I'll say tactically we can work with anyone. And, and tactically we go where our customers go. If our customer asks us, I want to work with WeTrade. I want to work with, with Congo, I want to work with, with DLT ledgers. For us, we will do that. Strategically, though, and that's why I make a difference between tactical and strategic, strategically, we really believe in, in, in a mindset that we, uh, that we have to look at how quickly can solutions be scalable. And that's why we're looking at things like Pepple, because if we can tap into cooperate with e-invoicing providers. E-invoicing providers, for example, they, they get their hands on, on invoices. E-invoicing, the moment you start financing invoices, and there's a lot of traditional trade finance which actually hooks into invoicing, it makes sense to me if you've got a huge network out there which is being increasingly being adopted by Singapore and out more than 30 countries in Europe, Canada, US, Australia, Singapore, New Zealand, doesn't it make sense then, because every trade transaction includes an invoice, to actually look at a, at, a, at a data strategy where we can bring the logistical world together with the financial world in which the invoice is such a key document. I'm, I'm a very strong believer of that. So I see it as, a, as an important path to this interoperability, not just within a certain industry, with an interoperability between the financial supply chain and the, the physical supply chain. End of sermon. Perfect. Yeah, Julian, were you seeing something? No, I, I, the, the, it was a great, great presentation. Thank you, Joel. And anyone who's got yeah. any questions, please ask or, or put it in the chat and we can ask it. Um, so how, how long do you think this is gonna take? And how can we accelerate it? What's the call to action? To us? Well, that is, that is the question, I think, on every uh, webinar, the question we go on every webinar. Exactly. The, 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 there's, there's a couple of things, yeah? It, it depends on the scope of what you want to achieve. How long will this take? What is this, of course? Yeah. I have to say that the initiative that ITFA took with its DDoC specifications, which are which aim to be uh, UN Citral MLETR compliant, this is meant as an interim solution. That's what we hope at least. We hope that either, well, two things have to give, either uh, common law or civil law gets adopted, but that historically has taken a long time. The other approach is you and CITRAL, Model Law for Electronic Transferable Records, gets adopted faster. Now only we know that Bahrain is currently 
the only country. Other countries are looking at it. So that's another approach. But I, I, I think that you cannot wait for these things. That's why we decided, because I know what ICC, the SI, I should not speak on behalf of, of, of them, but if what, what we support is, I would I say, a data and document-centric trade strategy, not a platform-centric trade strategy, because a customers, the customers, the people doing the business all over the world, if you take a platform-centric approach, you raise immediately all sorts of barriers from a competition point of view. The strategy that is applied has to be document-centric. So I am positive, I'm hopeful that, you know, by looking at the EBL, for example, as an industry, looking at the EBL as an industry, looking at electronic invoicing at an industry, and then those industry meeting, I think that can be quite a logical path. If you set the target, I'm going to change everything overnight at once, you will fail. So what Oswald has, has explained in terms of let's, let's see what we can do uh, to move from individual rule books, maybe try to tackle at a higher level, at an industry level, by, by coming up with the industry coming together on an EBL, that's an approach, if I understood it correctly, that I, I'm in favor of. E-invoicing, the same thing. Now, e-invoicing, the challenges, because taxation policies are different from country to country. But if I see the list of countries who currently support, who started adopting PEPL in their digital economy agreements, with Singapore, uh, uh, I know that India is looking at it as well, with Canada, with US, with all those European countries, if those countries... I think, which have a digital agenda and, 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 and those other countries have a digital agenda, meet each other on the digital agendas that you have on, on electronic invoicing and electronic bills of lading. So document-centric is fine, but then bridging it, bringing physical and, and, and financial together. That's, I think, a logical path and at the same time hope that the change in law or adoption of, of MLETR will happen, because that will be a major catalyst, of course. Uh, Joel, yes. there is a question from Martin Waltraff. He's asking about LCs, that's the credits, which are, you know, a little more complex than... Well, an LC, if, if, you, dissect, if you dissect an LC, uh, an LC is, in fact, a collection plus, because what happens with a collection mainly is, it's, of course, initiated or different ends. A collection is initiated by the exporter. You're collecting post-shipment. An LC is a pre-shipment instrument, yeah? So it starts, but from, from a data flow point of view, of course, they, they share a lot of infrastructure. The LC, of course, has the difference with the fact it has credit. Uh, it is tied into credit on the buyer side from the issuing bank. So it's a secure instrument, but it's, it's within the same spectrum it shares the documents. So in terms of resolving it, in, in terms of resolving the LC, you actually, the approach can be the same thing because to make the LC more efficient, and I'm gonna be saying things which I'm not sure who is, who is on the, but I'm, I'm gonna be just open and, and, and share what I believe. Moving an MT700 today from, from a FIN network, which is SWIFT to blockchain, it's not going to resolve the challenges. And I will admit the data exchanges can be made more efficient, more interactive than on a, on a centralized network with, me with messaging between different parties and flowing. I, I have, DLT can be much more efficient. But the, the elephant in the room in trade, whatever trade, where it's an LC or a collection, are the documents. So porting an instrument or the BPO from, from the TSU network to a blockchain network, what's up? Sorry, it's not resolving the problem. Documents are the glue in international trade. They enable financial and logistical decisions. Solve the document problem and you solve everything. And LC will, you know, the e-presentation is the missing component of the bringing the e-presentation together with the trade origination, the agreement, 
is, is what is going to change things. Not putting an LC on, on a blockchain network. That is my opinion. Um, so, so it is more complex. Why? Because the flows are more complex. A collection as the life cycle is very simple. You present, you accept, or you pay. So in terms of reconciling a flow, it's much simpler. Uh, the complexity of LCs is mainly about tracking all the shipments, keeping track of it uh, versus it's what happened also behind the LC. Uh, the, the orders, the orders need to be updated when partial shipments have taken place. But if you can move, if you can move to digital documents there, then you can resolve the LC challenges as well. That's my opinion. You're right, Joel. I hope I've answered uh, Martin. Uh, uh, you can ask me more detailed questions. I can be contacted on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm always, it's, it's more a challenge to get rid of me if you, if you start asking questions like that than actually to get me to answer them. Uh, this, sorry, John, to, to break you. Uh, the spam is asking it. How does one consume uh, so the services been offered by Chan Systems. Do we connect or require a license and deploy on firm? Ah, that's a very good question. I've got, I've got my, I hope I've got some members of my technical team on. But I'm first going to, before actually giving the technical response, uh, I'm first going to position China Systems correctly because, in terms of our technology, Exim Builds is our flagship product. Exim Builds can be deployed on premise or in the cloud. Our traditional model, of course, because Exim Builds is probably one of the most connected systems in a bank. Why? If you remember the list of systems at the beginning, a trade transaction generates accounting entries. We, 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 we take down uh, limits, credit lines. Uh, we post risk, we, we integrate with treasury uh, because we, 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 we do payments, we, we finance, we need interest rates. So it's, it's, we, we usually we're integrated between 10 and, th and, and, and 40 different systems in the bank. So it is from, from, from a deployment perspective, it can be deployed on premise or in the cloud. We provide also microservices. Uh, we have of course a microservices strategy to deploy our, our functionality. But I have to say, and that's something which is of course very a hot topic, historically of course it has been done and is still mostly done uh, on premise because of the heavy integration requirements to other systems which are not in the cloud yet. So if there's an overall cloud strategy that banks or, or anyone or corporates have, of course, it becomes easier. At the moment, if you, if you create an orphan in the cloud, especially for a trade system, which is so integrated, and if you have big volumes, you have to consider that, that you have, of course, you, your integration is very efficient. If you don't have high volumes, then deployment within the cloud becomes an easier decision. Uh, but, but in terms of the question, I'm probably giving you the business person responds, but uh, we can, uh, I don't know, Phil is, uh, let me see whether Felipe is still there in terms of consuming services. Uh, he can talk more about it if it's a really technical question. Um, I, I think you, 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 you explained it pretty well, Joe. So uh, whoever has our existing application, they can obviously um, have access to this functionality. And it is exposed also to our application via API. So we, we set up as an open API, and then you can actually consume these services from any endpoint that can invoke web services if you want to integrate it into other application. Or if you're happy, you can use our GUI to perform these operations. So all the communication is done via APIs, via web services, even with the Inigio stack, we, the bank should operate a node. So for this demo, to actually issue the documents, they operate an Inigio node, you inherit technology. Um, the whoever has the documents, they don't need to sign up to any network or any specific technology. They, they can just transfer the documents freely on the what we call the open node. Yeah. So only the bank in this in this uh, flow needs to operate an Inigio node.
Okay, thank you, Phil. Is that, uh, I think it was Palm who asked that. Uh, question. Uh, yes, it was Joel. Yeah, thank you. I got most of it. It was a, it was a little bit, um, the line went a bit funny on the audio, but uh, yeah, I got the gist. Thank you. Yeah. So it can be both. And like I said, all our connectivity uh, is, is with APIs. Um, also with the blockchain networks that we've integrated with. It's a seamless, it's a fully integrated experience. Uh, it's the way we integrate uh, also with others with, with uh, compliance with AI ML systems or document checking. It's all from a single uh, window actually. And we just, we just integrate our service in, in both directions uh, with, with partners to, to create a, an, an integrated experience for the end user. Yeah, that's excellent. I think. Uh, Any more questions? I think we've come over the time limit, actually. Yeah. Right, it's, it's past the hour, right? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, Andrea, are you there still? I think we may have lost Andrea. Oh. I'm here, Ju I'm here Julie. Just new <laughs> All right. I think, are you going to wrap up now? Perfect. Yeah, I would say we're going to end up here and, uh, you know, give you uh, goodbye and see you next week time in one week time with uh, one more interesting meeting. OK. OK, thank you from, from, from myself and China Systems for, for attending this session. I wish everyone a, a, a happy end of uh, and a healthy end of the year and a well, better 2021. Thank you, Joel. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.